Welcome to the Ormond Beach Historical Society Speaker Series, sponsored by a matching grant from the Florida Humanities. Dr. Peggy McDonald will be discussing Florida's female pioneers. Dr. McDonald, who's a native Floridian, is a public historian and the adjunct, adjunct professor at Stetson University and Indian River State College. Her publications include a biography of environmental activist Marjorie Harris Carr and a forthcoming book on Florida's female pioneers that today's presentation is based on. Dr. McDonald has written about local and Florida history and culture for Gainesville Magazine, Our Town Magazine, Senior Times, and The Forum Magazine. Dr. McDonald served as executive director at Matheson History Museum from 2015 to 19. She serves on the Alachua County Historical Commission and is an alumna of the University of Florida, where she received a PhD in American history. Peggy, over to you. Thank you so much, Bonda. Before uh, this session started, uh, we were talking about how this is the 10th year Bonda has organized a speaker series for the Ormond Beach Historical Society. That is true dedication. And uh, this is my second time presenting with the speaker series. And I can tell you Bonda is one of the most pleasant and organized and efficient uh, people around. And uh, it would be uh, hard to fill her shoes. But um, thank you, Bonda, for organizing this and for making the virtual talk so easy with these good directions for everyone to follow. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to be speaking about Florida's female pioneers. And I started this, um, this uh, topic back when I was the executive director of the Matheson History Museum in Gainesville. And I was told, if you look at this beautiful turn of the 20th century picture of a Victorian cottage in Gainesville, and if you look carefully at the little buggy in the horse and buggy, uh, that's Dr. Sarah Lucretia Robb. And I was told that she was the first female doctor physician in Florida. And I thought, wow, if that's true, that's quite an honor for Alachua County. So I started looking into it. Um, I quickly found she was not the first. Uh, those of you in the Ormond Beach uh, area and most people in uh, Volusia County who are interested in history have heard of Dr. Esther Hill Hawks. Um, she was actually the first recorded female physician in Florida, and she wrote in a series of um, lovely letters about her time in South Carolina and Florida during and after the Civil War. Um, she wrote about what it was like, what the challenges were for a woman physician. And you can still find this book on uh, at the library and also at um, Amazon and other booksellers, A Woman Doctor's Civil War. And it's based on her letters, not all of her letters. She wrote so many. It's just a collection of them. Now, she was a graduate of the New England Female College of Medicine, uh, New England Female Medical College, and it was the first medical college for women in the United States and probably the world. Now, she wasn't the first female medical uh, college graduate. Uh, the first uh, woman doctor in the United States um, uh, came earlier. But she was one of the early women to experience that transition from um, being a graduate of the medical college to trying to make the profession work. So um, this picture shows uh, Dr. Esther Hill Hawks when she was um, in her late 20s, a graduate of medical school. Um, when the Civil War broke out, she and her husband were abolitionists. She applied to serve as a doctor with the Union Army. And uh, because of superintendent of Army nurses, uh, Dorothea Dix's policy that nurses um, would need to be um, uh, plain looking and dressed in drab clothing. She was determined to be too attractive to be a nurse, but she also wasn't allowed to be a doctor because she didn't have a penis. Yes, I, I, I did say that word on Saturday morning. Um, but everyone knows that if you have one, you're a much better doctor, right? And that's sort of um, what this, this book was about. So Dr. Edward Clark wrote a book that was so popular, it was printed in multiple editions. It sounds like it's arguing on behalf of women's education. Sex in education, a fair chance for the girls. Clearly, if you want your book to sell, sex should be the first word, not only in the 19th century, but today as well. Well, in his book, Dr. Clark wrote that 
actually, um, education was damaging for women, uh, particularly women in college, and that when women studied and discussed big ideas and read texts, that it robbed the blood, it sucked the blood right out of their ovaries and into their brain, which left them sterile. And in this book, although he wasn't present at the autopsy, Dr. Clark uh, discussed one case where uh, it was death by college for a woman. So this is the sort of mentality that Dr. Hawks had to put up with. Um, as a result, when she and her husband, John Milton Hawks, who again, people from the Volusia County area would recognize him as the founder of Hawksville, later Edgewater, um, they moved to Beaufort, South Carolina, um, uh, right after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, of 1863. And uh, he worked as an army surgeon at hospital number 10, very creatively named. Um, and uh, Dr. Esther Hill Hawks was not able to get a formal appointment as a doctor, but because of being married to an army surgeon, she was able to slip between the cracks and serve. So in one case, when her husband was on a secret trip to Florida, she spent about two to three weeks in charge of the hospital. Um, she later said she thought if her patients had been white, she wouldn't have been allowed to do that. Hospital number 10 was created for the first official black color, the, called the color troops, the black troops in the Union Army. And the first South Carolina volunteers received a tremendous benefit from joining the Union Army. In addition to being trained to fight in the Union Army, they also received an education. And so Dr. Hawks served as a teacher. Later, after the Civil War, she and um, Milton wanted to continue working with freedmen who they had uh, developed a relationship with during the Civil War. Um, so she established in Jacksonville, Florida, what became the first integrated school in Florida and probably in the nation. Now, this is actually a picture of a South Carolina freedmen school, but you can get the idea of what the Jacksonville School might have looked like. Um, however, parents didn't like the idea of integrated schooling, so she um, and Milton moved with other former Union officers to establish a colony, a freedman's colony at Port Orange. And the name, um, of course, the idea for the name Port Orange stemmed from Milton Hawks. In this stereograph from Jay Whitworth's collection uh, that he's donated to the Matheson History Museum, you see early oranges. So the idea was that the Freedmen's Colony could support itself through agriculture, including oranges. However, um, Esther Hawks worked on uh, establishing a second school at Port Orange, a Freedmen's School. Um, and unfortunately, it also wasn't popular. The idea of teaching black and white students together wasn't popular in the Florida area. And so, in 1867, her school was torched. Um, she returned to the North and um, uh, her husband would winter um, with her in Florida, but um, this dream of the colony turned into something else that I don't wanna dwell on because I know you've been discussing it in the Ormond Beach Historical Society. Moving on to another Yankee woman who came to Florida, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, had this beautiful cottage at Mandarin. This is um, another image from the Matheson History Museum collection. And um, she moved to Florida um, after the Civil War and had a very successful uh, orange grove. And her husband, Calvin, for some reason, bears a striking resemblance to uh, rock star Sting. I think we need to get Her Henry Louis Gates to look into that uh, DNA uh, similarity. Now, Stowe popularized Florida through her book, Palmetto Leaves. And she wrote about the flora and the fauna in um, personified ways, um, just wax poetic about everything Florida. And her writing was so popular that she really spawned uh, Florida's tourism industry. And we had uh, a, 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 a surge of um, snowbirds coming to Florida. Um, here you can see an image of citrus at the Stowe residence and here is an image from the Matheson showing at Palaka uh, a wharf. And this would be where many of these Northern tourists would come between January and April 
to travel along the St. John's and the Ocklawaha River and take in the subtropical paradise that they had read about in Stowe's book, Palmetto Leaves. Um, this is a ticket, this is from the State Archives, showing Hubbard Hart's ticket. It says Ocklawaha Navigation Company. You could see the months that they ran from January through April. And there's even a heart-shaped stamp indicating this ticket was used in January. And of course, people dressed for the weather. It was cold going on the Ocklawaha, heading up north to the St. John's and this specially uh, designed narrow series of boats, the steamers that Hubbard uh, pioneered starting during the Civil War and perfected after the Civil War are what people would travel on as they came to Florida. Um, and what did they do? They, were, they really were told through Hubbard Hart's clever marketing scheme that you hadn't really seen the Ocklawaha until you'd seen it at night. And if you travel at night, you needed to follow up with a day trip. And here we see this turn of the, uh, well, it's an early 20th century um, hand-colored postcard showing the illuminated Oklawaha forest and the um, birds flying at night and, and um, all of the wildlife was illuminated by a giant torch on the ship. In this stereograph of the Matheson collection, you could see a hunter not even pointing the rifle at um, the alligator, right? The alligator is clearly already dead but the point is what people did when they came on these steamers was to marvel at and to shoot at anything that moved. Now, another Yankee woman who came to Florida uh, to write like Stowe, perhaps inspired by Stowe, <clears throat> was one of Florida's three Marjories, Marjorie Canan Rawlings. When she came to Florida, um, she purchased this house that's from approximately 1890 in Tiny Cross Creek in Alachua County. Uh, here's a picture of Rawlings with her husband, Charles, uh, about 1928, the year that they moved here. Um, Marjorie Canan Rawlings immediately fell in love with Cross Creek, with Florida, with this, um, this paradise, right? This tropical, subtropical paradise that had, was still largely undeveloped because it was originally the first colony in the United States, Spanish Florida and um, hadn't even become a uh, state until 1845. Um, what, just like Stowe, Rawlings decided that uh, she would have an orange grove and that would supply Charles and Marjorie with the income they needed so that they could sit around and read and write. Um, another stereograph from Jay Whitworth shows how tall the orange groves were allowed to grow um, at this time. This is again about the 1890s. So this is before Rawlings, uh, decades before Rawlings came to Florida. Um, so North Florida was famous for citrus. In fact, Alachua County was at one point the top producer of citrus in the state. This house is the Axline House. It's located directly across from Rawlings' house, which you can still tour today. It's now the Marjorie Canan Rawlings Historic State Park. But the Axline House is also on the National Register. And this is a picture from the Jay Whitworth collection. And you could see the tremendous wealth, relatively, right, speaking, tremendous wealth that citrus brought uh, to Florida. And in many cases, it was Northerners, such as Axline, who uh, profited from that. There was so much wealth from citrus in, in Tiny Cross Creek that you could see this uh, lovely musical group performing uh, in, in what appears to be a Florida jungle. Now, fast forwarding to uh, Rawlings, she crossed that line between writing about and observing a subculture, the Florida Crackers, and joining it. Um, you can see here she enjoyed um, hunting. Um, she also would practice some of the cracker traditions, such as fishing by tossing dynamite into the water, um, shooting federally protected birds. And she wrote about the, uh, the beautiful pies and other things she would make with these birds. Um, and and here we see her crabbing at Salt Springs. And uh, in this image from the University of Florida, George A. Smathers Libraries, um, archivist Flo Turcott has talked about how Rawlings, this was clearly a publicity stunt because there could be rain at any moment. She would have been on her porch writing, not out in the open. <clears throat> but if you look carefully by the typewriter, you can see Rawlings had mastered the lost art of typing while smoking. In this image, you could see Florence Turcott 
with the manuscript for Jacob's Ladder. Turcotte marks this as a turning point for Rawlings. Um, the reason that this, this manuscript is, um, is rolled out this way is uh, it's, it's sealed in mylar, encased in mylar, uh, mylar uh, because Rawlings typed on both sides of paper that she purchased in bulk during the Great Depression. Uh, Turcotte has said that Rawlings reached a low, that she had, uh, because of the um, failure of uh, the orange crop and because of the depression, she had nothing but a can of tomato soup and a box of soda crackers in her pantry. Then she won uh, her first prize and continued to win, including later the Pulitzer Prize for the yearling. And for Rawlings, this meant that she died wealthy with multiple homes, uh, a great success, and she was known. And this will stand in contrast uh, to another Florida writer we'll examine later. <coughs> um, so in terms of um, Rawlings, you can see here in this picture, she's looking a little more bedraggled. Um, Florence Turcotte has said, uh, she, she claims she doesn't remember saying it, that really Rawlings could have used a bra. Well, Rawlings had reason to look a little uh, crestfallen and uh, she had a friend, at least she thought it was a friend, um, uh, Zelma Kaysen, who she wrote about in the book Cross Creek from 1942. Well, Zelma Kaysen didn't like the description Rawlings had of her as an angry and efficient canary uh, who meddled with others' affairs and had the mouth of a sailor. So she turned to another Florida female pioneer, um, and this is uh, Kate Walton, the first woman to graduate from the uh, Florida uh, College of Law and be admitted to the bar. First woman, uh, one of the first, uh, she was the first Palaka attorney um, and she represented Kaysen. She was one of the attorneys representing her in uh, a, a, pre a pre unprecedented invasion of privacy lawsuit where she argued that Rawlings in her book Cross Creek had revealed these personal details of her life. And um, on appeal, she won the lawsuit. The uh, punishment, uh, the fine she had to pay was $1. This is the courthouse, the 1892, uh, I'm sorry, 1885 Alachua County Courthouse where in Gainesville where Rawlings would appear every day. This was the O.J. Simpson trial of its day. Reporters were outside the courthouse waiting to take pictures of Rawlings, see what she was wearing to court that day. Now, in the case of Rawlings, she wasn't directly sued because of coverture, the legal principle where a woman had no legal standing. So it was actually uh, her husband who was uh, who was sued. And uh, this court case, Turcotte has said, really devastated Rawlings. And she decided she would no longer write about Alachua County, uh, no longer write about Florida. And it was uh, it represented really the end of her writing career. Um, now, again, the, the stands in contrast um, to Zora Neale Hurston writing at the same time who never experienced the financial success that Rawlings did as a, an African-American uh, woman writer. The most successful uh, black woman writer of the early 20th century, and yet she was buried in an unmarked grave. Um, moving forward to another of Florida's three Marjories, uh, Marjorie Harris Carr arrived in 1918 in rural Bern uh, Bonita Springs, um, now, if you visit Bonita Springs today, it's no longer rural. Um, there's a giant three-story Mercedes-Benz fortress with Mercedes-Benz parked on top of the building. But when Carr was there, when Marjorie Harris was there, you could see in the background uh, no development, right? There wasn't even a bridge uh, at Fort Myers that went to the beach. Um, Carr, who was then Marjorie Harris, was raised by naturalist parents. She learned about uh, to identify the thousands of species of flora and fauna. And she also witnessed the uh, destruction of forest wildlife. Here with this alligator skin, you could see Marjorie in the middle, uh, the youngest child. Um, Jack Davis wrote in his biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas that by the 1880s in Florida, 2.5 million alligator hides had been harvested. And he compared that destruction to what happened out west with the buffalo. Um, also, Marjorie Harris Carr wrote later, um, she talked in oral history interview 
about how she witnessed the orange glow of the Everglades burning in the summers when she was a girl as it was cleared for agriculture. She became a zoologist. She graduated from Florida State College for Women, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, a member of the Sigma Psi Science Honor Society, and a charter member of the Florida Academy of Sciences. However, when she applied to the PhD program in ornithology at Cornell University, Arthur Allen, the uh, director of the program, told her point blank that women were not welcome in the field. Um, nonetheless, thanks to FDR's New Deal, she found a position as the first female federal wildlife technician in the United States at the Wallaca National Fish Hatchery. And there she met the two great loves of her life, the Okawaha River, which we've talked about before, and Archie Carr, known for uh, sea turtle conservation biology. <clears throat> because she was a woman, she had to conceal her marriage to Archie Carr. Um, Archie Carr was only making $40 uh, per month as a graduate student. Um, he couldn't support a wife. They eloped to the Everglades uh, without her mother even knowing it, came back from the middle of the night and Marjorie Carr's mother chastised them for being so in love and out in the moonlight and worried about the dangers. Archie slept on the couch and on their wedding night, Marjorie slept with her, her mama, he later wrote. Um, so in her early marriage at age 21, uh, she wound up working in Englewood at the Jack Bass Zoological Supply uh, Firm, and she captured everything from cockroaches to alligators and preserved the specimens to be studied in the best colleges in the Northeast. Um, here you could see her with a blue indigo, which her daughter Mimi Carr, who provided all these images, um, pointed out that she's holding the snake so gently. Well, fast forward, she, Marjorie Carr is famous for, um, for one thing in particular that we're going to get to, helping to stop the, uh, the construction of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. But before that, as she began her, um, her environmental career, she had uh, five children with Archie Carr. She wasn't able to get uh, daycare during that time uh, in the 1940s and 50s. And she did get a master's degree at the University of Florida in zoology. Um, she wound up launching an environmental career. So Payne's Prairie was described by William Bartram in 1774 when he visited, um, and he just described it as the great Alachua Savannah. It had maybe 20 to 30,000 head of cattle at the time. Uh, the Seminole were still there. Well, Payne's Prairie was almost lost to development, uh, but Marjorie Carr and other women in the Gainesville Garden Club stepped up and helped transform it into a state preserve and park. The same thing happened with Lake Alice on the University of Florida campus. In this picture from 1968, you could see that there's an algal bloom and a hydrilla. The University of Florida was pumping effluent directly into the lake. They didn't have a sewage treatment plant yet. So um, Marjorie Carr and Archie Carr and Jack Kaufman and Joe Little and others stepped up and fought for the lake when the University of Florida and Florida Depar Department of Transportation uh, announced that they were moving forward with plans to drain portions of the lake and turn it into a four-lane cross-campus throughway and 2,000-car parking lot. Thanks to Carr, the lake is still there today and people are married there. Um, and it's uh, one of the crown jewels of the Gainesville area. The Cross Florida Ship Canal started during the Great Depression as a way to put people to work in a, uh, during the Depression when there weren't jobs. However, there wasn't a serious plan to complete it at the time and when the United States started to galvanize for World War II and become the arsenal for democracy, funding was cut for the program. This picture is taken at the Santos Sheriff's Station where you can see some of the bridge stanchions that are being reclaimed by nature. Um, 20 years after the, pro the project stopped, it was reauthorized. Uh, or rather, it, the authorization existed for 20 years, but it was funded 20 years later and became the Cross Florida Barge Canal. If you look at the bottom left picture, you could see the um, picture of a third of the canal being completed um, at the time that Florida Defenders of the Environment and Marjorie Carr was one of the co-founders. 
um, helped stop the canal in large part due to this environmental impact statement that they produced and Carr edited uh, the document. Now, this environmental impact statement was not the first, right? There were earlier ones uh, that related to, in particular, the um, uh, Everglades jet port that we'll discuss later, but it was an important environmental impact statement. It was shipped out to all the major newspapers in the state of Florida that previously almost unanimously supported the Barge Canal, and after reading this document, almost unanimously were against it. Um, also, Marjorie Carr and FDE uh, initiated a federal lawsuit to seek an injunction to stop construction of the canal. That was ultimately successful, but it was the lawsuit was uh, usurped in some way by President Richard Nixon, um, who, uh, through executive order, halted construction of the canal because of the Oklawaha's value as a unique and beautiful river. This is the Oklawaha today. It remains dammed by the George Kirkpatrick or Rodman Dam. Um, and it's in limbo, although every governor except our previous governor, Rick Scott, had uh, supported restoring the river. Uh, a half century later, it remains dammed. And this is the river during a recent drawdown where the uh, artificially high levels of water are lowered uh, temporarily to kill off hydrilla. And you can see how beautiful the, the river is. In this picture, we see Marjorie Carr at the left, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the middle, about to receive an honorary doctorate at the University of Florida. And on the right, um, I'm gonna ask if anyone can guess who this is. Uh, this is a historian, a Florida historian. Uh, he's no longer with us. He started as a Catholic priest wrote extensively about early Florida. Um, it's Michael Gannon, and he presented Marjorie Stoneman Douglas with an honorary doctorate. So we have two of Florida's three Marjories together. There's no evidence that either of them ever interacted with Rawlings, uh, but if someone has any, any evidence, please do come forward with it. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas came to Florida after a failed marriage <clears throat> at a time when women still did not have the right to vote, 1915. Uh, Jack E. Davis has written a prize-winning biography of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, which is off also a biography of the Ever Everglades. Here in her Wellesley uh, senior portrait, you can see um, a young woman who is determined. She, could, she credited her Wellesley education, her women's college education, with uh, you know, pushing her to the status of being able to be um, a leader and a critical thinker. Also, Marjorie Carr went to women's college, uh, but not uh, Rawlings. Now, around the time that Douglas arrived in Florida, people still came to the Everglades um, uh, just as they visited the Oklawaha, right, to marvel at subtropical Florida. But overall, the view was that the Everglades was a wasteland, that it provided, because it couldn't be improved, because it couldn't be developed for commercial purposes that, um, that it had no value. So in, um, and also I wanna show you another um, image, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, second from the right, um, a little after she had arrived, a few years after she'd arrived in Florida. Now in uh, 1947, when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wrote the Everglades River of Glass, I'm sorry, River of Grass, she transformed that view of the Everglades from a wasteland to the most unique, one of the most unique um, uh, natural features in the world. And she starts the book saying, there is no other Everglades in the world. Now, later in her life, uh, uh, if you read Davis's book and Everglades Providence, it talks about how she really felt she had done her part to help the Everglades by writing this, um, this book. But um, as I mentioned before, the, uh, in addition to the ongoing drainage of the Everglades, there was the plan to turn the Everglades into the largest airport in the world, the Everglades Jet Port. And at this point, when Douglas was 79, she was recruited to help the Everglades. Um, Jack Davis credits her Quaker upbringing with the name Friends of the Everglades. And um, he would point out that although 70, 79 might seem older to be starting uh, or um, renewing this crusade for the Everglades, she lived to age 108. So um, as one of Florida's three Marjories, she left 
an indelible mark on Florida um, and um, continued until the end of her life fighting for it. I've heard from people who used to organize book talks where they'd invite her to speak about her writing and she continued to write books um, on a variety of topics. Uh, Davis actually refers to her as a philosopher. Um, she's, he, they would say she would talk about her book for maybe five minutes and then start the sermon on the Everglades. So she never gave up, gave up. she was determined. Um, and in, in addition to her, um, her name, right, her legacy, Jack Davis wrote two weeks after the tragedy at Parkland that um, her legacy would not be tarnished by that tragedy, that in fact, this the natural student movement that was born from this tragedy um, need look no further than their namesake, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, for inspiration. Um, another woman who was uh, whose leadership was critical in the time uh, before women had the right to vote uh, was May Man Jennings, who was known as the most powerful woman in Florida. She was first lady from 1901 to 1905, and that's when this picture was taken. Uh, um, and in this case, there's I have an image from the Orange County Regional History Center of a 1913 suffrage float. What's not clear is whether it was a suffrage parade entirely or one, one float in um, a, a different parade. But 1913 <clears throat> is the year that the National Women's Suffrage Association held its national um, march on Washington uh, for suffrage, fighting for women's right to vote, uh, pushing for what was called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, which later became the 19th Amendment. Um, in Florida, at the time that uh, May Man Jennings was active, uh, the idea of suffrage was controversial. It was seen as something that might go against women's other work. Um, in this, uh, this float from Orlando, you could see, uh, if you look very carefully on the banner, it says equal suffrage. And in 1913, the Orlando Equal Suffrage League formed with Mary Safford as president. She later became president of the, the state Equal Suffrage League. And uh, there was a convention held in Orlando. And this stemmed from a 1912 incident where the mayor of Orlando invited all freeholders to register to vote for an upcoming election. When women registered, attempted to register to vote, the city officials didn't know what to do. They would refer the women to another official and another. Finally, the city attorney said conclusively that under Florida law, women did not have the right to vote. So much like the American Revolution, the movement to, uh, in Florida to um, uh, create a state amendment and support a national amendment to allow women to vote was stemmed from the idea of taxation without representation. The women who arrived uh, to register to vote were turned away, but they were galvanized to support suffrage. Um, so we went from that fresh-faced May Man Jennings to this is later, this is when she co-founded the Florida League of Women Voters. So we all get older and fatter. Um, but she was president uh, from 1915 to 1917 of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. And this was a time when, as I mentioned before, suffrage was viewed as controversial. The view of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs was that if it supported suffrage, it would be a political issue and it would jeopardize the other important work the women were doing. Uh, work on behalf of Seminoles, work on behalf of historic preservation, work to establish um, uh, conservation activities. Um, so when May Man Jennings stepped up as president, she had a different view and she actually convinced the leaders of the Florida Federation to support suffrage. And in 1915, they passed at a state uh, convention, a movement to uh, lobby, um, a motion to lobby the Florida legislature to support an amendment to the state constitution to allow women to vote. They also voted into membership at the time, the Orlando uh, Equal Suffrage League. So um, Linda Vance, who wrote a biography of Me Man Jennings, argued that if you look at the list of members of the Florida Federation, both at the state level and the, and the local clubs for the uh, local women's clubs, and look at the list of members of the local and state Equal Suffrage Leagues, they were almost identical. Um, so 
Jennings uh, support was critical to the uh, success of suffrage. Now on June 4th, 1919, the um, uh, 19th amendment was passed by Congress an optimistic Gainesville Daily Sun article reported that Florida might be the first state to ratify it. Actually, although the 19th Amendment went into effect across the nation in 1920, Florida did not ratify it until symbolically in 1969. So um, another thing that was uh, part of May Man Jennings' legacy was um, she often went against, went against her husband's wishes. So as Governor William Sherman Jennings supported Everglades drainage, for instance, and you can see here in this image, uh, the, here's May Man Jennings and her husband at a, um, uh, the Everglades at a, uh, a dredging site. Um, she actually worked with the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs to establish Royal Palm Park, which became the nucleus of the Everglades. So she didn't always support her husband's activities politically, but she became known as the most influential woman in Florida uh, because of working through the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs um, and establishing other organizations for a variety of causes. Now, Mary McLeod Bethune was known as the first lady of Negro America. She was the most prominent uh, black woman um, uh, nationally uh, serving, for instance, on five different um, uh, presidents as an advisor, serving, serving the administrations as an advisor, including FDR's Black Cabinet. Dr. Ashley Preston has written a biography of, of Bethune examining her civil rights activities in Florida. Um, she teaches, uh, Dr. Preston teaches in the African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune was born the 15th of 17 children to previously enslaved parents. And she was the first child to be born into freedom. Now, when she was growing up in rural Maysville, South Carolina, there weren't any schools for black children and education was segregated. Um, and her work and the work of her siblings was vital to the family income. By the time she was nine years old, Dr. Bethune could, um, uh, harvest 250 pounds of cotton per day. Um, it was a sacrifice to let her go to school, but she begged to be able to go to school when a Presbyterian mission school opened up several miles from her home. Uh, she was so uh, transformed by the experience of education, she continued and she went to Scotia Seminary, now Scotia College in Concord, North Carolina. It was the first institution of ed higher education for black women in the United States, established in 1867. And she went to Moody Bible College with the goal of becoming a missionary. Dr. Bethune was later told towards the end of her program uh, uh, by the Presbyterian Mission Board that black women were not welcome as uh, missionaries in Africa. So rather um, than stopping, and uh, she shifted her focus and in 1904, opened a Negro and Industrial Institute for Girls, um, a girls college in um, Florida. Uh, first she started in Palaka and then moved to Daytona Beach. That school later moved, merged with Cookman Institute and uh, became Bethune Cookman University. Um, her activities were critical to uh, civil rights in Florida and the suffrage movement. In this picture, you could see from 1904, uh, Dr. Bethune in front of a, a almost endless looking line of children. Uh, those of us uh, who work with children regularly know how hard it is to get one child to do what you want to do. And look, she's not even looking at the children. She has her back to them and they're all doing exactly what they should be. In this picture showing Dr. Bethune as principal of her school, um, this was the time when she, like uh, May Man Jennings, was working for suffrage, but not only for black women, but also for black men who, according to the Constitution, according to the 15th Amendment, had the right to vote, but because of literacy tests and poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and other means instituted to get around the 15th Amendment, black men and women were almost universally unable to vote in Florida uh, and across uh, much of the nation. 
Dr. Bethune, at the time she was working for suffrage, couldn't work within the established movement. The local and state movements for women's suffrage discriminated against black women who had their own clubs that they then formed. Even the National Association for Women's Suffrage, um, which was associated with Liz Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, and Susan B. Anthony, would not let black women march in 1913 in Washington, D.C. with the other women in their states. The black women from all the states had to march at the back of the parade, like going to the back of the bus. It didn't deter Bethune from pursuing suffrage. At night, she offered free reading classes so that black men and women, once the 19th Amendment, and of course the 15th Amendment was already in effect, but once, once the 19th Amendment uh, was ratified, so that they would be able to participate in the voting process. Um, the KKK approached her school with the idea of torching it, according to Leonard Lempel, historian from Bethune-Cookman University. According to uh, Lempel, Bethune led the girls in song and the singing essentially drove off the KKK. And Bethune later led students on a mass uh, uh, drive to vote. They walked to the polls to vote. Um, in this picture, you could see here in the center, uh, Dr. Bethune with Eleanor Roosevelt and also the president of Bethune-Cookman. This is at the Daytona Beach um, Airport. Now, this was in the last year of Bethune's life. Um, you can see she's kind of being supported uh, by others. But this shows Bethune's power that for the commencement speech in 1954 at Bethune-Cookman, she was able to bring in Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, can you imagine uh, a more um, inspirational speaker um, that she could um, use her connections? But this friendship with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was, was very important to uh, her ability to develop other connections at the national level. Now, this is the year that a statue of Dr. Bethune is scheduled to um, be installed at the US Capitol Rotunda National Statuary Hall and it will replace Confederate General Edmund Kirby Smith's uh, statue. Um, I have checked and can't find any updates if, to find out if uh, COVID-19 is interfering with that, but 2020 is the year that this is scheduled to happen, and Dr. Bethune's statue would be the first statue of a Black woman to be installed inside the uh, National Statuary. Now, the final female pioneer I'm going to discuss today is Betty Mae Tiger Jumper. Uh, like Bethune, um, she had a less um, uh, privileged upbringing than some of these other women. When she was a child, she and her brother were almost put to death because of a seminal custom that so-called, um, uh, the, the, the product, she was a product of a French woman and, um, uh, I'm sorry, French trapper father and um, a seminal woman. And the term that was used at the time was half-breed. And she talks about it in her biography that was written um, along with Patsy West. Um, and she talks about um, how her grandfather made the decision to take the family to the federal reservation so that they would be safe because there were uh, threats on the children's lives. Well, um, Betty Mae Tiger Jumper made uh, another first where she became one of the first seminal children to be formally educated. Uh, like uh, Dr. Bethune, she uh, really begged her mother to be able to go to school in, um, uh, uh, in North Carolina at a Quaker school. That's where she met her husband. Now, when her husband came back from World War II, he had PS, a PTSD and he couldn't provide for the family. Um, now, one thing in, in uh, more recent times, right, 20th century uh, tourism practices, uh, that was very lucrative for young Seminole men was alligator wrestling. Uh, this image is uh, uh, from the uh, state archives showing alligator wrestling uh, in Miami. Well, um, it, on a good day in the 1940s, a young man could make up to $100 in tips from alligator wrestling. They talked about how the tourists literally threw money at them. So Betty Mae Tiger Jumper needed to do something to help out since her uh, husband was uh, suffering from PTSD, and so she wrestled alligators. Um, in addition to that, 
she went to a nursing school in Oklahoma. And the idea was to bring back uh, more advanced methods of healthcare uh, to the Seminole Reservation in Florida. And she became one of the um, uh, leaders of the group with all these innovative ideas. She also was uh, one of the people who transformed um, the uh, Seminole newspaper. But she's most, um, she also went to the Florida uh, Folk uh, Festival. Uh, this is an image of her um, uh, talking, telling stories of uh, Florida Seminole stories. But she's uh, best known for being the first woman to be um, elected to the, uh, the leader position of the uh, Seminole, uh, Seminole tribe of Florida, but also the first elected woman of any recognized American Indian nation. There were appointed women leaders appointed by whites, but it's the first uh, Native American or American Indian to be elected um, the uh, uh, chief or the leader, right? The uh, tribal representative. Um, in this case of the Seminole tribe. So um, I hope that, that you get a sense of optimism despite all the challenges these women faced. Arriving in Florida at a time when women couldn't vote, um, be, you know, becoming uh, the first in their field in so many different ways, their stories are inspirational. And at this point, I'd like to see if there are any questions uh, to, to address. So I'm going to look at the comments. I don't see any. Um, if there are any uh, questions you'd like to type in now, we have uh, some time left. And while we're waiting for questions, I'm going to start the survey. Okay. Uh, so I would ask everyone to please fill in the survey for us. It's very important that we get feedback to the Florida Humanities. You should see it there uh, now. It'll only take you a couple of seconds to do it. I see a couple of questions there, Peggy. Okay, I'm entering my website for free articles on many of these women, peggymcdonald.com. Also, I neglected to share the forum issue. This is the latest forum issue from the spring, spring 2020. And this is uh, the democracy issue. And also there's a story on the centennial anniversary of women's right to vote, the 19th Amendment ratification. Um, this is available. Um, you can sign up to get Forum Magazine for free by visiting Florida Humanities website. Um, it's also available digitally. Uh, and again, that my website, PeggyMcDonald.com, there are multiple dozens of articles I've written on Florida history, including the female pioneers that you can access for free. Uh, it's, and it's MacDonald, M-A-C, not Mick, PeggyMcDonald.com. Let me see if there are other questions. I don't really see any any other questions at this point. I'm just looking here, Peggy. Okay, uh, we have uh, leave this up for an, another couple minutes in case anybody has any additional questions. I appreciate everyone who's filled in the survey. Uh, Forty one of you. Uh, so keep going. There's a few more people who can give us feedback that we'd really appreciate. It only takes a second to, uh, to do that for us. And we thank everybody again. We certainly thank Peggy for learning this new technology along with all of us. Uh, she was great to work with. I appreciate her kind comments at the beginning. And we really appreciate everyone in the audience. We appreciate that you've hung in with us this year as we've you know tried to switch from our normal in-person presentations that we all would love to be able to do right now uh, to this new virtual uh, presentation format. Uh, our goal at the Historical Society is, is preservation and education as you know and so we were determined that we were going to somehow keep doing these presentations even uh, in the age of COVID. 
So we hope that everyone has a great summer. We'd urge you to look at the presentations from the Florida Humanities. I typed in their website over there under chat. And um, someone asked how many viewers. We had um, 65 total viewers this morning, which is great. Uh, someone else is saying virtual was a wonderful program. Thanks for bringing it to us. Someone else said shocked that Florida waited until 1969 to ratify the 19th. I was too. I'm not a native Floridian. Peggy is. Uh, I'm not. And when I was looking in some, some things about suffrage, I saw that fact as well. And I was just horrified. <laughs> Although once it was ratified, it was, it was moot. Uh, women could in Florida could clearly vote, but that was funny to me. Peggy, do you have anything else to say on that? It was not, it was Florida and other Southern states. Um, and there's another component to that, which was that um, in addition to being against women having the right to vote, there were many uh, state uh, legislators that were concerned that it would offer the vote to uh, black women and that there would be another 2 million African-Americans, black women voting uh, nationally if women got the right to vote. So in many cases, it was not, not till the 60s and even the early 70s that you started to see uh, different Southern states finally ratifying symbolically. But as you mentioned, legally, the vote exists, the right to vote existed, except of course, in the case of continuing discrimination against African-Americans that uh, didn't end until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, so, but it's an ongoing fight, right? We know that with what's going on now with um, efforts to block uh, former felons from voting. So it's, it's ongoing. I see, when is your new book coming out? Um, I actually am working on two projects at the moment. So Florida Female Pioneers and also Florida Women's Fight for Suffrage. Um, and I'm, I'm working on the suffrage book first. So, uh, so it'll, uh, I hope maybe I can come back another time. Talk about that. <laughs> well, we'd love to have you back uh, again, Peggy, for sure. And um, I just wanted to note, there were several states, uh, I think mostly Western states that did give women the right to vote prior to the 19th amendment. Is, uh, do you know of that? Yes, the Western territories, but especially Wyoming, where it was the first in the world to offer the women's suffrage. Of course, there were reasons that weren't entirely altruistic. So if you think of who traveled out West, you had the Homestead Act, you could get free land, even, even women could get free land uh, for, through the Homestead Act, but there weren't many women who went. And it was women's idea that if you offer the right to vote to women, it would encourage more white, um, essentially middle-class, uh, people to come to these frontier towns where you had um, the, you know, uh, criminals and you had uh, cowboy type elements and you had, um, you know, prostitutes. And these were the, the same women who wanted to cut down on those act activities, right, through temperance, uh, the movement to uh, just like they'd be thrilled probably that you can't drink in a bar today <laughs> in Florida. <laughs> but these, these same women, they may have been progressive in some ways, but progressivism did not mean they were enlightened in terms of race. Um, in Florida's movement, it's another topic, but Florida's movement for suffrage started with a woman who grounded the right for women to vote on how white women should not be represented by the so-called alien, the foreigner, uh, an immigrant, and the so-called Negro. That's what Ella Chamberlain said when she kicked off Florida's suffrage movement. So. There's a lot of xenophobia and racism in that history. I see some more comments here. Someone kindly asked how else to donate. And I did put in our address there. If you want to send a check, we'd love it. Uh, Ormond Beach Historical Society, 38 East Granada Boulevard in Ormond Beach, 32174. I put that address over there in the chat. Um, I see 92% of you have, have filled in the questionnaire. So thank you very much. It's important that we give that feedback to Florida Humanities. Someone asked, when is your new book coming out? Did you answer that uh, question, Peggy? Yes, and I see also someone referenced the great PBS uh, documentary on, um, on women's suffrage. That is something interesting to look at. 
And um, it's also, you know, important to know, looking at the national scene, women such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, were, you know, they didn't live to see this right, right? They didn't live to see the right to vote. Um, someone had commented about it. it took 70 years to get 19 passed. So symbolically, that's why before it became the 19th Amendment, women referred to it, women who were lobbying at the state and a local and federal level to get uh, legislation passed to allow women to vote, referred to the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Um, but there have been uh, many books and, and many documentaries uh, done on uh, the special friendship between uh, Stanton and um, uh, uh, Katie, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, but I think we're, we're moving more now in the direction of looking at you know, other parts of the suffrage movement, including you know, what, who was excluded from this movement. And I think that we're going to be reading more on um, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and other women involved with the uh, Negro Women's Club movement. And again, Dr. Ashley Preston at the University of Florida um, has uh, specialized in that. So I recommend uh, you take a look at, at her work. Uh, speaking of Dr. Bethune, uh, Nancy Lohman, who's one of our life members has been instrumental in working on getting that statue um, put in into um, um, the Capitol. That's right. And wow. I, know, I know that it had been scheduled to uh, be placed this summer. So uh, for our audience there, I will check with Nancy uh, as to where that stands now, and I'll publish something in our History Happenings newsletter. If there's anyone on here who's not uh, receiving our History Happenings uh, electronic newsletter. It comes out twice a month. You can go to our website and sign up for it, and it tells you about these programs and all the other things that we're doing at the uh, Historical Society. Um, someone commented, I was going to ask you this question, and someone said that uh, Betty Mae Jumper uh, died in 2011 at the age of 87. I wonder when, uh, when she passed. And there's a hospital at the Hollywood Reservation being named for her that's under construction. Oh, cool. It's supposed to withstand Category 5 hurricane uh, winds. Ah, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, someone said, when is uh, uh, Bethune's statue being placed? And I don't know the exact date. It was supposed to be this summer. I will check and I will publish that information. Oh, where is it being published? I'm sorry. Are placed. It's being placed in Statuary Hall in the uh, Capitol in Washington. Uh, if you've if you've been there, I actually was just uh, in Washington last uh, summer and had a wonderful tour of the Capitol. I had written to our representative uh, Michael Waltz. Uh, you, if you can do that, if you're going to Washington, you can. Uh, contact his office and request a private tour of the Capitol. I assumed there was going to be, you know, four or five or six people there uh, going on the tour with me. And they, and it was just me that day. So it was really wonderful. I uh, had a great tour and we went to Statuary Hall and there's many statues there of important, mostly men, almost all men in the uh, nation's capital, right off of the rotunda that you always see on, on TV. Uh, and so her uh, statue is being placed there. Okay, um, Peggy, we may have run out of questions. I see that 92% of our people have taken the survey. I really wanna thank everybody for doing that. And again, thank everybody for tuning in and certainly thank you, Peggy, so much uh, we appreciate, I love the uh, presentation. I, I know about a lot of those women, but I learned a lot more about uh, most of them. Uh, so thanks again. We appreciate all your efforts in making this possible. And we will look forward to seeing our audience uh, come September. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And I'm going to close out the uh, the presentation. Thanks a lot.